friends, I'm Jill Morricone, and we're just so glad that you have tuned in for this edition of 3ABN Savas Group Panel. We're in a brand new quarter just launching into 2023. This topic is on stewardship, managing for the master till he comes. Our quarterly was written by Elder Ed Reed. He is a student of the word, an attorney, an ordained minister of the gospel, served for many years as the director of stewardship ministries of the North American Division and of course he's been here to 3ABN before and we're looking forward to this study. First I got to introduce to you my family on the set. To my left Ryan Day so good to have you here. Amen. I'm excited about this quarter study and uh, I'm looking forward to spending time with you guys Amen. as well. And what's your lesson on? My today? lesson today is God is the owner of everything. Yes. To your left, Pastor John Loma King. Glad you're here, Pastor. Good to be here. And mine is on resources available for God's family. I love it. To your left, Brother John Denzi. Glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here. I have Wednesday, Responsibilities of God's Family Members. Mm. Last but not least, my sister in Christ, Shelly Quinn. So glad you're here. It's always a joy to be here with you. It's a joy. We're glad you're joining us. I have Thursday's lesson, Treasure in Heaven. Amen. Mm. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Ryan, would you pray for us? Yes, absolutely. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we now embark on this incredible journey, Lord, of learning about how to manage your resources, how to be a good steward of your property, Lord. Um, I'm looking forward to this lesson, but yet, Lord, we dare not dive into this uh, series of studies on our own merits or on our own ideas or with our own knowledge. We ask that you pour out the Holy Spirit yeah. upon this panel, that each and every one of us speak according to your will and that each and every person watching around the world also will be drawn closer to Jesus, His will and His plan for our lives. So we turn this time over to you and we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 The theme of this lesson this quarter is stewardship. And you know, stewardship is not just about money. Pastor John, stewardship right. is about time, mm -hmm. talents, temple, testimony, and treasure. Mm -hmm. Even more, as the lesson brought out in the introduction, it's about our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. Here's a quote from the lesson. It is only the darkness of this sin-laden world that causes us not to appreciate fully the status we have been given in Jesus. What is that status? Children of the heavenly King. So many times the lure of the world, the things of the world can pull us from Christ. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10 says, the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. There are at least 2000 verses in scripture about how to handle money our attitude toward money, and this concept of stewardship. This quarter, we will be studying that what we have really belongs to God. We'll mm -hmm. be looking at tithes and offerings, at financial management, and what are we supposed to do with debt? We will study the purpose of wealth, and what is the purpose of wealth? To spread the gospel, to hasten the second coming of Jesus. That's laying up treasures in heaven. The second purpose of wealth is to help the poor, to minister to the least of these. We'll unpack the danger of covetousness and look at the rewards of faithfulness. It's really a practical lesson, 12 lessons. It's a practical study, how we can deepen our faith and trust in God and encourage you and I to be faithful stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to us. This week, lesson number one is part of God's family. And I think there's two principles that are foundational to the lesson before we really jump into my lesson on Sunday's day. The first principle is ownership. And Ryan, I think you'll cover that clearly. That literally we are part of God's family, that God is the owner of everything. And as we look at that we belong to him, our memory text is 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. The second principle that's foundational to this lesson is not just ownership. The second principle is stewardship. God has entrusted resources to you and I to manage for him. Now, what is stewardship? 
The Oxford Dictionary says it's the job of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or property. The Wikipedia says this, it is an ethical value that involves the responsible planning and management of resources, such as environment, economics, health, property, information, technology, or theology. Now this is Jill's definition. Stewardship is the management of what God has entrusted to us because everything belongs to him. That's right. Stewardship includes our time, talents, temple, testimony, and treasure. In the Garden of Eden, God gave stewardship of the earth to Adam, did he not? Mm -hmm. In Genesis 2.15, he said the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis 1, we see God bless them. This is Adam and Eve, the man and woman, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. What's that word? It means to take care of, to direct, to manage that stewardship, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. This week, we study the privileges and the responsibilities that we have as part of the family of God. On Sunday's lesson, we look at we are part of God's family. Now, I'm going to take all the verses that we're using in that lesson, but we're going a little different direction. And I want to talk to you about worldview. What is your worldview? Some people have an atheist worldview, do they not? What's the atheist worldview? There is no God. They do not believe in the existence of God or a divine being. Psalm 14 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think Christians, even people who outwardly claim to believe in God, can be practical atheists. What mm -hmm. does that mean? People who act as if God does not exist. We can outwardly claim the trappings of Christianity, but in our lives we act as if there is no God. Then we have agnostics which believe it is impossible to know how the universe was created or whether or not divine beings exist. A practical agnostic is someone who acts as if they don't care whether God exists or not. We have deists. You know, they believe in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, God created the universe, yet natural laws are gonna determine how the universe plays out. In other words, God wound up the clock and then he kind of let it go by the laws of nature. Deists believe that religious truth is subject to human reason, not divine revelation. They push aside the Bible. And yet we can think we're Christians, but yet be a practical deist because some Christians act as if reason is more important than divine revelation. And they only follow a God that they can understand according to scientific principles. So what about a Christian? What about a Christian worldview? What should be our worldview? I'm going to give you seven elements to a Christian biblical worldview. You knew that was coming, Ryan. Seven elements. But obviously there's more, so we're just, for the sake of time, mentioning seven here. Uh, element number one, the Christian worldview is that God is our Father. Right. Amen. Right. God also is Jesus' Father. We look at Matthew 6, 9. In this manner, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We don't believe that God created the earth and then he just left it. Right. We believe that God is our Father. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Element number two, we believe that God is our creator. Not only is he our father, he also is our creator. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, of course, we also believe Jesus and the Holy Spirit were intimately involved in that creative process. We have element number three, Jesus is our redeemer and savior. You know, it's one thing to believe that God created this earth. It's another thing to believe, okay, he's my father. But it's another thing altogether to understand that Jesus, God, became a man and died for you and for me, that he is our redeemer, that he is our savior. Colossians 1:14, in whom we have redemption 
through his blood. That's through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 7 says really the very same thing, does it not, Shelley? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Element number four of the biblical worldview. We believe that God adopted us as his children. Not only is he our father, not only is he the creator of the world and the everything that's in it, not only is Jesus our redeemer and savior, we have salvation through him, but we are adopted as sons and daughters of him. Amen. Our memory text, 1 John 3, 1, we've read it before, behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And Paul in Galatians 3, I love this. Mm -hmm. Galatians 3, 26, he says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise in Christ. We have all those promises. His promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Element number five, God cares intimately about us. We are never alone. The biblical worldview has the understanding that every trial you walk through, every difficulty you encounter, everything you experience in life, God the Father and Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit walk with you through that. Isaiah 43, one to four, we won't read it all. What does it say? Thus says the Lord who created you, who redeemed you, don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. You are mine. You belong to me. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. The biblical worldview says that this God, the God of the universe, walks with you and I here on this earth through everything. Element number six, not only does he redeem us, he wants to live in us by the power of the Holy Spirit and recreate in us the image of Jesus. You see, we're not just saved to sit. We are saved because God wants to remake and recreate us in the image he had in mind in the very beginning. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, we are new creatures. The old thing has passed away. The old man or woman of sin, that old life with its addictions and habits and tendencies. And in Christ, we become new. Mm -hmm. Element number seven, God's purpose in our lives is for you and I that we would represent him to the world. We are saved, we are transformed into his image. And then 1 Peter 2, 9, we are a chosen generation, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special people. Why? So that we can proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. What an incredible privilege is ours to proclaim that gospel of grace that we are truly sons and daughters of God and that others can be as well. Mm, yeah. Amen. Fantastic foundation. Thank you so much, Jill, for laying that for us. My name is Ryan Day, and I have Monday's lesson entitled, God is the Owner of Everything. Let's just go ahead and say that together right now. I'm, I can hear you at home. God, God is, is the, the owner, owner of everything. You know, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. We know this to be uh, the, the Ten Commandment chapter. And it's quite interesting that oft oftentimes we read Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and we read about the Sabbath. But for for the sake of this particular lesson, the words came to my mind, the beginning verse, the beginning words of verse 11 in Exodus 20, where it says, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. If he's the maker, then he's the creator. If he's the creator and the Bible says he created all things, then that makes him obviously the owner because God is the owner of everything. And so obviously my mind was also taken to, as I was studying this lesson to Revelation chapter four, because again, this same point is, is, uh, is very clearly communicated in Revelation chapter four. And I'm going to read verses nine through 11. John is in vision and he's, he's been taken in vision into the very throne room of God. He's there among God in his throne and he sees these four living creatures and he sees these 24 elders. Notice what it says here beginning in verse nine. He says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crown 
grounds before the throne saying, notice the words, mm -hmm. you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you, notice, for you created all things right. and by your will they exist and were created. If he created it, that makes him the maker. If he's the maker, that makes him the owner. God is the owner of everything. That's what we're establishing in this particular message very clearly. And I love how you can go all through the Bible and, and I mean, if we, we could probably spend a whole nother hour or two just gleaning through all of the powerful texts where God establishes this very clearly that you and I, we don't really own anything other than our characters, right? Uh, we have sure. control over that in the sense that we can, we can yield that to the Lord or we, we, we hold it in ourselves. But everything else is the Lord's. Psalm chapter 50, verses 10 through 12. I love this. Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12. Notice what it says here. It's, this is, this is uh, uh, God speaking. He says, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the <laughs> world is mine in all its fullness. I love that. He's making it very clear. Look, it's all mine. I created it, yes, for your pleasure, but it's still mine. Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1. Again, it's reestablished here. It says, the earth is the Lord's. And oftentimes we walk up on this earth as if it's ours. We <laughs> buy that land and we think that's my land. We, you know, and again, I recognize from a worldly perspective, yeah, you know, you take care of your land, but at the end of the day, it's not yours, it's God's. Because it says the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Did you catch that? Not just the earth is his, but it says the world and those who dwell therein. Why? Because this lesson's bringing out clearly that God is the owner of everything. And we want to make that very clear here today from the Bible. Uh, you know, the lesson brings out and br it reminds us of the story of David, King David. Uh, you know, he, he wakes up one day, he goes to the prophet Nathan. He says, hey, you know what? I want to I want to honor God. I want to bring homage and glory and respect and reverence to him. I'm going to build him a house. Our God needs a, a foundational place right here in Jerusalem. And I'm going to build him a glorified house. And even at that time, Nathan had said, oh, it sounds like a great idea. You know, you're God's man. Do what's in your heart. But that night the Lord came to Nathan and he spoke to Nathan and he said, look, David's not going to build my house because he's a man of war. He's a man that spilled a lot of blood, but his son shall build my house. And so then when the message was relayed to David, David's like, ah, oh, well, at least... You know, Lord, can I can I gather all of the belongings? Can I gather all the materials? Can I can I lay the plans and lay the groundwork so that my son can build this in honor and for your glory? And so God granted him that ability. And so, of course, David, again, he gathers all of the, you know, all of the wood and all the stone and all the gold and the silver and all of the elements that's going to uh, the, that's going to be put together for the building and the constructing of God's house. And there came that day where David brought everyone together. And I love this text here. It's just it's exciting to read it. Because because 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 13 and 14. David was a real brother. And this is those word, word, the words here he says here in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 13 and 14. He's gathered all the people together. He's now about to consecrate this and say, Lord, here it, here it is. All this stuff is for you. We're putting it together. We're building it for you and for your glory. And he says in verse 13, Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise you, your, praise your glorious name. But who am I? I love this. Yeah. But who am I? And who are my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly as this. For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. <laughs> In other words, what he's saying is like, look, you know what? We've gathered all these things. We're going to construct it and put it together for you. But at the end of the day, I mean, who are we to try to take, a, take you know, credit or to try to say that this is done by us or this is ours or that we own this? Because at the end of the day, Lord, we're ultimately what we're doing is we're giving you back your own stuff. That's exactly what he's doing. He's right. giving God the credit where credit is due. And of course, this makes perfect sense because the Bible makes it very clear that God is the owner of everything. You know, this is even this even goes far and beyond the material things of the world because we can easily, you know, say, well, this, you know, this table came from wood and the wood is the Lord's and this property is the Lord's and the stuff that this building's made out of is the Lord's. The camera that this recording this right now is obviously everything came from something that God created and made. Therefore, he's the owner of. But oftentimes what we do is we come to a point in our life where we say, well, but I'm my own. Mm -hmm. No one owns me. I'm my own person. Mm -hmm. But yet when we study the Bible greater, we see that 
even ourselves, even us, even down to our very flesh and bones, our very person, God has purchased us. And I want to continue on the sanctuary theme because when you get over to Ezekiel chapter 8, this is clearly communicated in the sense that one of the greatest mistakes that man can ever make is to reach a point in life where they think that something that is not theirs is theirs. They're going to mm. steal away or they're going to take away or usurp yeah. God's authority or God's power or the glory alone that belongs to him. And this is exactly what we find happening in Ezekiel 8 because God takes Ezekiel the prophet in vision through a very distinct descriptive scenario in which he walks him through the sanctuary to show him this is the reality of what God's people have done to me. And ultimately when he shows him, he takes him from you know, the north gate where there's an image of jealousy. He takes him on to all these abominable beasts on the walls. He shows him these women weeping for Tammuz at the north entrance. 25 men with their backs to the sanctuary worshiping the sun. They have taken away what is the Lord's. And you know this to be the case because when you get to Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 6, God himself speaking to Ezekiel says, furthermore, he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Now turn again and you will see greater abominations. This is the Lord's sanctuary. It's the Lord's house. Even Jesus Christ made this point very clear when he shows up in, in uh, what we know as Herod's temple, even though it wasn't Herod's temple. Again, Jesus shows up to cleanse the temple and he had to cleanse it. Why? He says, because it is written, my house, my father's house, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When we reach a point in our life where we think that's mine, that's mine, I'm going to take this. At the end of the day, it's all God's and we are his stewards. Entrusted, as Jill brought out so clearly, we are entrusted to take care and to manage that property appropriately and responsibly. Uh, even, even in Haggai chapter 2, verses 8, when he would send them to lay the plans for this third temple or the men would lay the plans for the third temple. Again, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Solomon's temple, he took back all the gold, all the silver, all the things. And ultimately his grandson, Belshazzar, would take those things and he would profane them and misuse them, misuse and abuse them for his own selfishness. But in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, God says, look, let me remind you, the silver is mine, the <laughs> gold is mine. It's all mine. Why? Because God is the owner of everything. Even as I said, down to us, we are bought at a price. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, mm -hmm. verses 19 and 20, we talked about the earthly sanctuary, but yet the Bible makes it very clear in, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are not your own. God owns you because God owns everything. He purchased you with his blood. First Peter chapter 1, verses 17 and 19. A couple of scriptures just to end the segment here. You've got to write these down. First Peter 1, 17 and 19. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's works or each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. God didn't purchase you with mm. silver or gold. He didn't go to his money houses and say, here, I'm going to give you $17 trillion for this many people. No, 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 no. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And of course, Acts chapter 20 brings out the exact same thing. Our spiritual gifts, our talents, our time, our land, our property, our money, all of these things. It's all God's. We're just here to, we're entrusted with it and have the responsibility to be the appropriate stewards and, and to be responsible for taking care of the Lord's property. Just never forget that God owns everything. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What a great lesson. God owns everything. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 of Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study, Part of God's Family. We're going to turn it over to Pastor John Loma King in Tuesday's lesson. Yes, I am on Tuesday, which is resources available for God's family. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ryan, for 
laying the foundation. You know, the writer of the lesson, and I know him very well, uh, Ed Reed, uh, we did some work together and I did a resource project for him. And so I appreciated his approach because I know for sure that he's a man of, of, of integrity, a man who understands finances as it relates to the Christian walk. One of the points he brought, brought out in the lesson is God's greatest gift to his children is Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why God is the one who owns everything and the motivation for giving and the motivation for God making his resources available to us is he made the most valuable resource available to us, his son, mm -hmm. for God so loved the world that he gave. And so every resource under Christ, every resource through Christ is available to every one of us. And Jill, I've got nine takeaways, <laughs> and, but some of those you've already <laughs> taken. I'm just going to still have them anyway. Good. As we look at the benefits, we understand that God's resources are un, uh, undeniably available to his children, but sometimes God's resources include others that are not his children. Mm -hmm. We have Matthew 5, verse 45. He says that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So there are those who don't know God that benefits from God's benevolence. When the sun comes out, Christians don't have a sun spot over them and other people <coughs> in the darkness. That's the benefit, which gives people motive that if God is the one who provides all of these gifts, regardless of how I live, how much more benefit would there be if I turn my life over to God? And that's why I love this. The promise that is behind all of God's resources is Psalm 23 and verse 1. When we can say this, everything after that will be a part of our experience. The Lord is my shepherd. What's the rest? I shall not want. You know, when I think about Christians, I love how you talked about God owns everything. And Jill, what a foundation you both laid. When we can say that God is our shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, then the benefit, the tag is, I won't have any need that God cannot provide. So let's go through some of these takeaways and then we're going to lay some foundation as to why we should never consider ourselves to be able to provide anything for ourselves. This is brought up by both of you. God is creator. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God, mm -hmm. full stop. No one else in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the, so the resource from which all of our blessings come is from the heavens and the earth because they belong to God. Everything belongs That's right. to God, which brings me to my second point. God is the sole owner. Yeah. Psalm 24, verse one, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Not only are the inanimate things belonging to God, but the animate things belong to God from the smallest molecule. You know, sometimes you see a fly that's walking on your hand. You feel it, but you don't see it. And you zoom in, and you see this thing that's smaller than a nail. And you think, how does that move? God has a purpose for everything he creates. Sometimes you see uh, in, in some of the farmlands you go to that on the back of the, the rhinoceros or on the back of the hippopotamus, there are birds eating things off of his back. Everything that God creates has a functional purpose. It all belongs to God. The earth and all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it, whether they acknowledge God or not, their, be, their beginning is from the hand of the Almighty. Then God is the sole proprietor. You know, God's restaurant is a restaurant I'd always love to go to. <laughs> because he says in Psalm 50 and verse 12, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Right. <laughs> for the world is mine and all its fullness. God is to provide for all of our needs. Right. Not only our outside needs, our financial needs, but as the children of God, we will never go hungry. Because even the Lord himself says, I own all the food. So therefore, if I were hungry, I wouldn't ask you for food. That's why when his disciples sometimes looked at the Lord as he was ministering to people, like the woman at the well, they said, Lord, you're hungry. He said, okay, go to town and buy some food for yourself. But my food is to do the will of the Father oh. that sent me. And I understand that because sometimes when I'm locked into a Bible study, my wife is saying, you're hungry, eat first. I lose my appetite right. because the greater filling of my life is when God's food, that spiritual food, mm -hmm. is poured in me and then poured mm -hmm. through me. He is the sole proprietor. Not only that, Ryan, you hit this one again, but I'm going to hit it again. Right. God is the source of all wealth. I love the way you put the context to that. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. 
all the standards of all the financial systems in the world, the standard is gold. But the gold belongs to God. He uh -huh. establishes the standard. You know, you buy silver, or if you do buy silver, if you purchase gold items, the value in that gold comes from the hand of God. That's right. The gold and the silver, all the metals that exist, even platinum, which is very, very rare, all of its values find its beginning in the hand of the Creator. The other thing that we point out, point number five, is God's supply is inexhaustible. Yes. I have seen in our own ministry, my wife and I have come to the end of our rope to realize that God is just unrolling his rope. We were sitting at our uh, home there in the mountains of Weaverville one day wondering, how are we going to provide for all of our family members that are coming to live with us? We don't have any money. We are just down to our last. And a knock at the door, one of our church members drove about 40 miles over the mountains of Northern California and said, when she had her devotional this morning, God said to her, Pastor John and his wife has this need and she extended her hand early Sunday morning mm -hmm. and she said, when I, was devotion, when I was reading this morning, God told me you had the need. Mm -hmm. God, in Philippians 4.19, Paul says, mm -hmm. and my God shall yeah. supply how much? Oh. All your need according to his riches and glory by <laughs> Christ Jesus. And then the other thing is God is reliable. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is reliable. Psalm 37, verse 25 I love this. I have been young. And I can say this. I don't say I'm old. I'm getting there. Cut it out, guys. <laughs> and now I'm getting old. <laughs> Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, right. nor his seed, as the King James Version says, nor his descendants, as the New King James Version says, nor his descendants begging for bread. God provides, he is reliable. As we're young, as we're going older, as we're getting older, as we start looking older, God is always there. Amen. Then God is the chief agriculturalist. You know, all the cattle, they belong to him. The grass belongs to him. Psalm 50 verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. Get this, God does not count his cattle by heads. Mm -hmm. He counts them by hills. <laughs> what a God. I love that. <laughs> the chief agriculturalist. Then God is the sole sustainer. Who can sustain better than God? You know, when you look in the heavens, and I love to do that, I'm an amateur uh, astronomer, but I have a telescope finally. But when I look at the heavens and the sustaining grace of God, and I see things that never moved, and I begin to wind the clock forward, even on my iPad. Well, what was the position of that star uh, back in 1865? And I notice the order that God established consistently stays there. God is the sole sustainer. That's why Psalm 55 verse 22, speaking to us, he says, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Mm -hmm. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Amen? Amen. 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 God is our sole sustainer. And then point number nine, amazingly, I got that number nine. <laughs> God is the ever-present provider. Psalm 121, verse eight. The Lord shall preserve you. You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. How often can we rely on the Lord? When we go out of our home, he's with us. When we come back in, He's with us. When we're traveling, he's with us. When we're in the air, on the ground, he's with us. He says, I'll be with you from this time forth and even forevermore. And then one other thing I add here is James 1:17. Now you must know that when God provides, God does not have a low standard in his provision. God has a high standard in his provision. James 1 verse 17, every good gift, what kind of gift? Good. good. Every good gift and every perfect. What a perfect gift, not mediocre, God is not right. mediocre, is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Mm -hmm. So when God blesses, he blesses in a way that is far beyond, exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. Is God's resource available for his family? Mm -hmm. You better believe it. But then now the question is, how do we access that resource? Mm -hmm. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Here's the only thing that God asks you to do. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things right. yeah. shall be added to you. If you believe that God's resources are available, when you seek his kingdom, they will be available to you. Mm -hmm. 
This all-inclusive God becomes the personal God when you follow his plan for his resources. Amen. 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 What a blessing to hear each and every one of you. It's a, quite a blessing. And I believe in this lesson, like the other lessons that we've had, uh, all of us can learn something. And I encourage you to study the Sabbath School quarterly. I have Wednesday's portion. My name is John Dinsey. And the title is Responsibilities of God's Family Members. Mm -hmm. I remind you of the memory text. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Mm -hmm. With that perspective, we can understand that our Heavenly Father, as you've heard, who is owner of all things, will take care of His children. Mm -hmm. But the children are not just to be idle, waiting for uh, our Heavenly Father to pour all the blessings upon us. God expects action and reaction from us. The lesson brings out uh, two texts that I'd like to bring uh, to your attention. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Matthew 20. 2 verse 37, Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Mm -hmm. This is a commandment. You must make a decision whether or not you will love God. When you move to the New Testament and you go to Matthew chapter 22, Jesus answering a question that he was asked, which is the great commandment? Mm -hmm. Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Your entire being is supposed to love God. Well, what's the foundation? Why should we love God? Who is God that we should love Him? Uh, like you've heard, He's the owner of all things. And through every second of your existence, He has been blessing you. He has been there and He has even protected you when you have not even noticed. In fact, you are the recipient of His blessings, blessings every single moment, every single second, because the fact that you are breathing is a blessing from the Lord because He created oxygen. He is the one that keeps you alive. He keeps your heart beating. He keeps your blood flowing. God is in complete control. You know, if God were to take a vacation, we would be in serious trouble. If God were to say, I think I will stop the sun where it is and just leave it there for the next 40 days, what will happen to humanity? We would cease to exist. And you have probably heard that the earth is just far away from the sun that we don't burn away. We don't burn up mm -hmm. and we come just ashes. And, but it's not too far away that we don't freeze to death. <laughs> God is good. God is good to all. And now when this commandment is given to us that we should love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, all of our mind, it is not a blind commandment. It's not a do it and uh, without thinking because God has given us ample, abundant reasons to love Him. Mm -hmm. uh, because really, He works on the principle that only by love is love awakened. And every single day, like I have mentioned, you are blessed. There is a verse in Psalm 68, 19, that says, Blessed be the Lord God who daily loads us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Daily, you are loaded with benefits. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded one time a phone call came in from this guy. It was a I guess uh, somewhere around one in the morning. And this is one of those calls you don't expect to get. We're working here at Master Control a long time ago. And he says, uh, why do I have to be thankful for? I have mentioned this story. Why do I have to be thankful for? He caught me by surprise. But these questions came to mind. Are you in a prison? No, you should be thankful. Are you uh, in an insane asylum? No, you should be thankful. Did you get to eat today? Yes, I did. Oh, you should be thankful. God daily loads us with benefits, and we have so much to be thankful for. God's love is revealed in nature, so much beauty in nature. Mm -hmm. And we can see these things and understand that God cares for each and every one of us. So when we are instructed to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, our mind, our soul, we have ample reasons to do so. The lesson brings this out, and I'd like to read to you. 
uh, it says, how would you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? How do you do this? How do you manifest to God that you love Him? The lesson brings some scriptures that we need to read, and one of them is Deuteronomy chapter 10, and we're going to go to verse 12 and verse 13. And it says, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, that is to reverence Him, to walk in all His ways and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart mm -hmm. and with all your soul, and to keep his commandments, the commandments of the Lord, uh, and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Mm -hmm. The idea of keeping God's commandments is for our good, yes. for our benefit. And remember, we are talking about that we are part of God's families and we have responsibilities toward God, responsibilities toward one another. The idea that we're family is an idea that we're supposed to be of help and support to one another. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, we have these words. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. Remember, they are for our benefit. They are for our happiness. And the lesson brings this out. I'd like to read to you. It's very, very well put. Keeping the law, obeying the commandments. For many Christians, unfortunately, the idea of obeying the law, especially the fourth commandment, it says here, is legalism. They consider it legalism. And they claim that we are called simply to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. However, God is clear. We reveal our love to God and to our neighbor by, yes, obeying His commandments. The lesson continues to say, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, which we read, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. And it says, we are used to looking at this verse as well. We love God and therefore we keep His commandments. But notice, it says, but perhaps we can also read it as this. This is the love of God. That is, we know and experience the love of God by keeping his commandments. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced God's love? You know, we can take a moment each and every single day yeah. to remember that God has poured out so many blessings upon us. Yes. And of course, the greatest blessing is that God sent his only begotten son right. to yeah. die for us. Does that show God's love? In an unmistakable and powerful way, God sent his son to die for us. And the reason we should love God and keep His commandments is because we love Him. We appreciate that great gift of His Son. We appreciate that He created oxygen that we can live in. We appreciate that He gave us another mm. day of life. Right. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to be thankful for. Mm. I think I have enough time to read First John chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. Mm. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, the Bible says, and the truth is not in Him. In him. So the idea that you say, oh, I know God, but if you do not keep His commandments, you become a liar. God tells us. If you love me, keep my commandments. And we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind. And I encourage you that if you do not love God with all of your heart, consider what he has done for you. Mm -hmm. And I need to read uh, verse 5. But whosoever, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked, because uh, uh, this is talking about Jesus, the way he walked. What did Jesus do? He went about doing good. He went about saying good things to others. He went about sharing the love of the Father. And you know, uh, there is a scripture that is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. I'm going to read as many as I can here before my time runs out. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he 
who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, so excuse me, I encourage you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, follow him with all of your heart, and you will be blessed and happy. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you. What a wonderful lesson we're having. And I just have to add to what you were saying. Obedience doesn't save us. We are saved by grace through faith. God has an everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith. He established that in Genesis 15, we see, and in Galatians 3, 6 through 8, let me, it, Paul's quoting there, actually what happened in Genesis 15. He says, just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's righteousness by faith. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham and the scripture for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel. The gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand. The gospel is the good news that God is going to make us righteous by faith. But you know what? When he announces to Abraham in Genesis 15, some years later in Genesis 17, he says to Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. Yeah. What? <laughs> God's always expected obedience, not that it saves us, but it is to be motivated by love because He has given us boundaries. His laws and His commandments are boundaries to give, protect us, protect our love relationship with Him mm -hmm. and with others. Now, when Jesus came in Matthew 5 through 7, is, it records the Sermon on the Mount. What is the Sermon on the Mount? It is the inaugural address Jesus is giving as the king. And we find this is the renewal of the everlasting covenant. New covenant means renewed covenant. So let's read Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 is where we'll begin. Jesus is preaching. Oh, he's teaching. He's speaking with great authority. And he says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart is will be also. Treasure is a figure of speech used here. It's what we value, whether it's tangible or intangible. So let me ask you, don't you believe that what we value determines our priorities? Mm -hmm. So are you putting your value on earthly things? That will be your priority. If we only love God because he first loved us, if we understand, I guarantee you, if you understand God's plan of salvation, you will stand in holy wonder. I, I just daily, I'm so overwhelmed by what God has done. But where we store our treasures, where, where are we putting our treasure for safe keeping. See, it's a matter of the heart. What you treasure is going to be a matter of the heart. Where is your heart focused? Mark 12, 30, which goes with Deuteronomy 6 and Matthew 22. I like this particular quote of Jesus because he adds a word, love the Lord your God with all your heart heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He's answering, what's the greatest commandment? Mm -hmm. Here it is. What God created you for. He's not up there as some dictator saying, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. What God created you for, what he created me for, mm -hmm. the purpose 
is that we would have a reciprocal love relationship with him. He wanted to share his love and his love is demonstrated by actions. Ours is to be as well. How on earth do you love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? I can't do it in my own. Absolutely. If I love God with all my strength, he would always be my first priority. And I confess there's times I let ministry be a priority over him. Has that ever happened to any of you when you get so busy? So Romans 5, 5 says, he pours his love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, even to love, we've got to be, have that Holy Spirit in us. And when he's in us, we know how to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and strength. We, God is looking for voluntary obedience. He doesn't force us to anything, do anything. That's why he gave us free will. But we need a transformed heart that values the love of God and what he has to offer more than wealth and material possessions on earth. I always pray every morning, Psalm 5110, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Did you know you and I cannot create a clean heart? The word create here is bara. It, it, there's two he, right. the Hebrew words for create, but bara is only used of God. Only God can create a clean heart in you. And David went on and said, renew a steadfast spirit within me. God's plan is that you be totally dependent upon him. He says in Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. So set your mind and your affections and your heart on things above. Bob, give them your attention rather than the things below. That's what Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 2. Set your minds, keep them set on those higher things, not on the things of the earth. I want to read 2 Corinthians 4, 18 to you from the Amplified. And I think this is an interesting, uh, it helps us see this better. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church and he says, since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are visible are temporal. Now in parentheses in the Amplified, and anytime it's parenthetical in parentheses, that means it is an expansion of the word from the Greek. So the things that are vis visible are temporal. And it says brief and fleeting. Mm -hmm. But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. See, Paul's life was one of faith because he focused on the unseen realities of God. And he knew that Christ's judgment is in the future. So he exerted a great effort mm -hmm. to do the things that please God. So real quickly, how do we lay up treasure in heaven? That's important. First step, 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wisdom and knowledge of God's plan is treasure. Paul said in Colossians 2, 3, in whom in Christ are hid the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. Lay up treasure for heaven for yourself in heaven by gaining this. Second Corinthians 4, 6, and 7 says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. However, we possess this precious treasure, that divine light of the gospel in vessels of earth, earthen vessels, frail vessels, human vessels. And it says, 
that the grandeur and exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. You know what? We got some good Bible teachers and preachers here on this panel. They don't get any of the glory. The only thing they are shining forth is what God has given them. And I will include me in that as well. It was an ancient practice to lay up your treasures for safekeeping in earthen vessels. But you said it, John. If we are going to lay up treasure, we need to seek first the kingdom of God, put his cause first, the fruit of good works to advance the kingdom is laying up treasures in heaven. We work on behalf of others to bless them and financial support of God's church and the Christian ministry is laying up treasures in heaven. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Shelley, Brother Johnny, Pastor John and Ryan. Thank you for sharing. We are just getting started. This is lesson number one, managing for the master. I want to give each one of you an opportunity to share a final thought. Amen. Acts chapter 20, verse 8. This is a text that I didn't get to read uh, in my lesson, but it says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. This is Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus. He says, Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, just reestablishing God owns everything, even us, and we have to be uh, responsible managers of his property. Yes, and the other one is God's blessings are conditional, 1 John 3, 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, when you look at Wednesday's lesson and you see responsibilities of God's family members, you think of the word responsibility as duty, you have to do this. But in reality, when we consider that we love God with all of our hearts, it's really a joy, mm. not a responsibility. It's something you do because it naturally comes out of you because of you're grateful for what God has done and continues to do for you. Amen. I'm just going to repeat the primary scripture that I had. These are Jesus' words from his Sermon on the Mount. He was so excited to say this. And he, he advises us today, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and the rust destroy and thieves break in to steal. Lay up treasures in heaven. Amen. Thank you all so much. I want to invite you to join us next week. We're looking at God's covenants with us. We love you. We're so grateful that you're part of the Three Man family and we will see you next week. We're going to go out today with prayer. Holy Father, we come before you and we're just grateful that you are the owner of everything. We're grateful that you have entrusted to us as stewards to manage those resources. Right now, we give you our hearts. We give you all of us and we seek to be vessels of honor. Keep us until next week in Jesus' name.